Okay, we're all here, Tony. Great. First, thank you, Amber, for putting this together. Congratulations. This is really, really fantastic thing. Thank you. And in the interest of time, I just will ask one question, and this is a general, because this is a question that's come up to me from various people. The people who've had their gallbladders taken out, and they really struggle with how to do this. And so what are the special needs, or how do they modulate to do a carnivorous or ketogenic diet? Thank you. Mm, there are no special needs for those whose gallbladder has been removed because uh, uh, the ductus will take over the part of the gallbladder and the enzymes are uh, created as well. So the gallbladder is just for the storage of the gall. But should they take en enzymes? No, 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 not at all. Just to contribute to personal uh, uh, evidence, I have no gallbladder, and uh, it's taken out years ago. No problem whatsoever, a ketogenic diet. So there's actually two really neat compensatory strategies that your body does when you whip out the gallbladder. So the first one, if you imagine that you've got the gallbladder and you've got the, the bile duct feeding down, this is what Zafir just referred to, over time, that actually dilates, and that could potentially hold, you know, a few mil, maybe up to 10 mil of bile. So it becomes almost a, 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 a little residual store that mimics the bile, the gallbladder. It doesn't store the same volume, but it does store a little bit, does inject a little bit in. And as with every other physiological function, we'll take sweating, for example. Somebody from a hot climate will sweat more, they'll have a higher capacity of their sweat glands to produce sweat than somebody from a cold climate, because it's trainable. So the bile production in somebody without a gallbladder because they don't have that store, theoretically will be able to enhance their, uh, I guess on demand, bile production to meet the needs of the diet relatively effectively. And I absolutely agree that if you have had your gallbladder out, very few patients, if they moderate their fat intake and progress gradually, will ever have a problem. And I, honestly, I can't recall one who was never tolerant of a high-fat diet. Okay. Thank you. I just thought of something. Um, could someone out there help, help us know when it's getting close to 12? I think we can go till then. Mark's got it, thanks. Okay. It smells really good in here. <laughs> <laughs> Question for the low-carb doctor. I wasn't completely following the slide about colostrum. Can you expand on that at all the, and the relationship when you said that whey was added? And the, What I understood was that there wasn't much effect of just taking the colostrum until adding the whey. Uh, no. So what it was is the, the, the left-hand side of the slide actually demonstrated pre and post in uh, diclofenac with colostrum, and the right-hand side was pre and post with whey. Um, and the active ingredient is actually a, a growth factor called transforming growth factor beta, which has been shown to stimulate um, basically cells. That's what growth factors do. Great. Thank you. Actually, this question is for Paul. Um, I, you, I didn't get a chance to get a shot of the, of the uh, slide fast enough, but did I hear correctly you were saying that there's actually medication that seeks to, through these same mechanisms, increase the permeability of the gut in order to achieve uh, its delivery into the body. Is that right? Yeah, it's a very active area of pharmacological research at the moment. So they actually use nanoparticles and they bind it to drug molecules. Because um, the big problem is if you're delivering a peptide molecule, which is a peptide is just a little protein, is the enzymes in the gut will just snip it up and it won't be effective. So. I guess uh, there is a desire if we're trying to deliver a drug target somewhere to actually have that absorbed into the body, um, not being damaged, as it were. And nanoparticles is one way that we can actually bypass the intestinal barrier, um, for better or worse. Yeah, this is actually one of the scariest things I've heard at this conference so far. So <laughs> thanks for the clarification. Uh, I had a question about the toxic compounds that were being discussed in chocolate and coffee. Uh, do you happen to know if these are water soluble? Because we have seen hints of this with people, although it does seem to be pretty individual. 
So I don't, I don't know about the solubility of, of um, those. I would think, given the molecular structure and given that we take caffeine in the in a um, aqueous base solution, I would assume that those xanthines are soluble in water. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has anything yeah. to add? Um, just as a follow-up, so do you think this would make it past, for example, a paper filter for coffee? Well, the xanthines? Yeah. Absolutely. Because okay. if you use paper, a lot of people use paper filters on their coffee, and they still get caffeine. And even tea bags, you know, are paper, and so it certainly gets past the um, paper of the tea bags as well. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Clemens. I, I've heard you comment many times about the importance of organ meat especially brain and liver. Uh, could you please comment on how we might, in the United States it's hard to find organ meat, and even if we find it, none of us know how to cook it. I don't. So how, uh, do you have any recommendations on how we might prepare organ meat, especially uh, brain and liver, and why you think it's so important? So I do think that it is very important in uh, patients cancer patients, autoimmune patients, if you have a high level of inflammation, and it is also associated with diseases, inflammation is eating the antioxidants, the vitamins, so depleting your vitamin D, for example, if you have a chronic uh, inflammation, also depleting the iron, and so on. That's why it is more important for patients to eat uh, liver and the brain. And, and the preparation is just very simple. You can put it in the broth, for example, and cook it, or you can fry it in lard, or there are more sophisticated recipes as well. Um, I've been eating liver by um, basically deep frying it in tallow, so beef fat. So you can just like put it down when it's really hot, um, fry it until the blood kind of rises to the top, flip it over, and it's pretty good that way. Those are pretty simple. It's like a really thin steak, but that's how I've been eating liver. About how long on each side, Michaela? Oh, it's, <laughs> God, um, it's going to be like rough, but maybe if it's really hot, like everything's boiling, maybe two minutes. Like it cooks really quickly, and you can see because the blood kind of comes up to the surface, then just flip it right away. Okay, thanks to each one of you. I have two questions. Um, first of all, I read something on the internet that, um, <laughs> that vegan crotch might be a thing. <laughs> Do any of you have any experience with that? No, okay, so my real question is for Paul. Uh, based on the work uh, in the, the talks I've seen by Thomas Seyfried on cancer, he basically says that cancer cells ferment two fuels. One is glucose and the other is glutamine. It's the second fuel in the chain. And I just wondered if how that fits into what you were talking about glutamine. Yeah. My presentation actually had 300 slides, and I cut it down a bit for this talk, and there was a section on glutamine and cancer. Um, I did think about it, and I wonder whether the glutamine to feed the cancer actually comes from necrosed cells, uh, from basically decomposition of the DNA, and whether or not ingested glutamine would be is readily available for a mitotic process. Um, so I haven't read any strong literature either one way or the other, but I suspect that dietary glutamine is probably not, you know, pro-cancerous. Okay, great, thanks. I'd like to say thank you also, Amber, for doing this for everyone here. Much gratitude. And also to all the speakers, thank you so much for being here. This is very important. My question is specifically to Dr. Jofia, and maybe the others as well can uh, uh, maybe say something about it if they have something to input. Um, we have a big uh, discussion on our Facebook pages about liver and toxicity, vitamin A more specifically, and also something new that I just learned uh, from somebody that could even throw your hormones out of balance. Um, and if these are actually true when you eat animal 
you know, liver from uh, animals and not a synthetic vitamin, uh, is there an upper limit of liver we can eat in a week that maybe we should go beyond? Um, or is there, hey, unlimited, no big deal, and we won't have any side effects? So there is no upper limit uh, from the point of side effects. I do think so. Um, there, there is obviously a, a rational limit. If you only eat liver, uh, then uh, your uh, ratios will not be correct because the liver is containing too much uh, carbohydrate. And uh, so the, the fat to protein ratio is not appropriate. You will not be able to overdose vitamin A because uh, actually the vitamin A is existing in two forms. And one form is coming from the plants, that is the retinol, and it is the form of the vitamin D, vitamin A that can be overdosed because it does not entirely match with the pass for using the vitamin A. And uh, you will not. Okay, and, and if you have vitamin A from the liver, it is just completely matches your pass. And uh, there is a feedback regulation, so you, you cannot over eat vitamin A in, in a similar way that you cannot overeat vitamin D. Excellent. So when I was in second year medical school, there was a multiple choice question, with a multiple guess question. And one of the questions was, an Arctic explorer died of which condition? And that was basically the only information that we got. <laughs> and it related to some historical case studies. Um, where some Arctic explorers, I think they were consuming polar bear liver or something like that, and they consumed it to a level where they actually did have vitamin A toxicity. So it has been described, um, I've been examined on it, is it a realistic concern in our population and is the vitamin A level different between a polar bear liver and a, you know, a, a bovine liver? I, I really don't know. Um, it's theoretically possible, but I've never seen it clinically. There are some ethnographic reports that uh, they, uh, they, the bear liver is a, is a, a problem, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much. And also it to the gentleman who is asking about how to cook liver, uh, why not just eat it raw? <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, this is going to be primarily for Paul, but could be answered by almost anyone. Um, in the interest of helping narrow down the ideal, not the ideal food, but I saw you guys, various people, argue what we may have more ratios of. Um, the animal-based lectins you spoke of, do you have any knowledge or can you expand on that and if that may guide what the more optimal foods may be or people that maybe have problems with certain animal-based foods? Well, I guess uh, in terms of animal food intolerance, there's some really nice research out in the last couple of years looking at different uh, epitopes or, or different uh, pieces of antigen that stimulate immune responses. Mm -hmm. And if you take somebody with type 1 diabetes, for instance, and you have a look at the common antibody responses to that, then you can actually pick up a whole lot of animal foods that might actually provoke a reaction. And one that stood out to me was mackerel. And I recall that because that's something I eat. And it's like, oh, shit, really? So... <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so basically, there are certain proteins, and e every meat is different in terms of its protein constituents. Um, so we've got a bit of an epidemic of something called mammalian meat allergy in Australia, um, which actually is precipitated by having a tick and then you get this alpha-gal um, reaction and it's only mammalian meat which actually has this alpha-gal antigen that you react with. So certainly different meats, di different people will react differently to different meats and there is now evidence to support that. In terms of lectins, uh, Stephen Gundry describes um, uh, lectins that gets formed uh, from A1 milk. Um, but when you actually, well, he describes it as a lectin. When you actually look at the research, I, I think that's a little bit wishy-washy. Um, he also talks about a, uh, I think it's a new 5AC or something like that. And if you have a look at that, then uh, the actual receptor was actually evolved out about two million years ago, that particular constituent 
in uh, human evolutionary history. And it would make sense that it would evolve out at the same time that we'd start eating meat. So I don't think that's a realistic concern either. Oh, very good. I just want to say I am terrified that that tick is in the United States and causing problems because I think we should all, as uh, red meat lovers, be extremely terrified of that. I've had Lyme disease before, so I know, you know, how that can happen. So, uh, anyways, well, thank you so much. Well, it actually is a serious condition. It actually causes full-blown anaphylaxis. And uh, on the part of Australia I live in, Sydney, on the shore, the, it's endemic. Um, so people are advised to take out their liquid nitrogen spray and freeze them off as soon as they get bitten. All right, well, thank you so much. And by the way, that is in the United States. A researcher at the University of Virginia has done quite a bit of work on that. It's in part of the south, at least in the southeastern U.S. I, I know because I grew up there, and that's a real concern when I go back to where I grew up. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I'm sure I've read that it, it, it's temporary. So all is not lost if that worst case scenario happens to you. Maybe it will go away. Um, hi, I'm not really sure who to direct this to because I know a lot of you have knowledge of the microbiome. Um, but my question is, um, I've seen a lot of um, talk in the media about how we need to eat lots of probiotics. And, and I think the, the subtest to that is that it, they're fiber-based, vegetable fiber-based probiotics to support um, a high level of diversity in the microbiome. And I'm wondering, you know, when I think about my own output compared to my input, there's not that much coming out. And so I'm thinking that what I take in is highly um, bioavailable and therefore maybe not just high, highly bioavailable for me, but also for my microbiome. And I'm wondering, you know, what the, if that diversity is something that is <clears throat> like a red herring or a distraction or something that in and of itself, you know, is a benefit. Um. So as far as I know, the, all, the, all of the studies that I've ever looked at that talk about diversity go back to a single study in the Hadza where they're comparing, um, they're comparing the Hadza people and their gut biome with other people in the West and they said, oh, well, they're their biome's more diverse. Um, so, so point one is that's just one healthy community. That doesn't mean that all healthy communities have the same gut biome. Diversity may or may not be desirable. There are many ways to measure it. Um, but I don't think we have enough information to specifically recommend high diversity. Uh, point two is that... Um, there are many ways to get short-chain fatty acids, which is behind a lot of the concerns, besides just eating plant fiber. They're going to be produced anyway, and so that also seems to be a bit of a, a misunderstanding. A um, third thing I wanted to say about it is that you don't need to support a biome that's basically has the entire function of breaking down something that you don't eat. So if, if you eat a lot of, say, broccoli, and you don't have the kinds of flora that would help you digest that, then maybe taking some kind of probiotic might help with that. But if you're not eating that in the first place, there's no reason to try to upregulate the uh, uh, population based on somebody else's idea of what should be there. I think that's most of what I have to say about that. So I think the big misunderstanding is that you can actually significantly control or change your microbiome by putting in a probiotic. Essentially, your probiotic will feed on what you eat, and if you don't give it the right nutrients, it will die out. So if you are taking a probiotic, you will only ever get a transient change in your state of your microbiota unless you also change your diet. And changing your diet is the most effective way. If we take a artificial sugar called trehalose, which is used to reduce the freezing point of dairy foods, using ice cream, things like that, that was introduced into the food supply about 2000 after it was figured, the Japanese figured out how to make it in commercial quantities. And this feeds a particular bacterium, an endemic form of Clostridium difficile. So there's two types of it. 
And from about the year 2000, we started having this massive epidemic where this bug would proliferate. It would lead to a condition called pseudomembranous colitis and people would die. And they've actually traced that back to the introduction of this particular substrate for it into the food supply. And I guess just in terms of what Amber just said about the need for short-chain fatty acids being produced by fermenting fibre, beta-hydroxybutyrate is a metabolite mm -hmm. of short-chain fatty acids in enterocytes. That is, why don't you just put ketones into your enterocyte in the first place? Nutritional ketosis will do just fine. Um, there's also, from what I've read, there's also anecdotal evidence that... Um, reducing your diet to meat doesn't necessarily reduce your diversity. I know um, I've seen like anecdotal reports of people's microbiomes becoming more diverse. So I think there's a lot we don't know and it's, well, it's hard to figure out what to do with what we do know. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, hi. Um, this is a question for Sophia and Michaela. Uh, Sophia, uh, I follow your social media account, and I noticed that Michaela visited your clinic um, recently. Uh, like, I'm also a strict carnivore like Michaela also. Can you sh sh share any insights um, beyond, you know, uh, eating more organ meats that you had with Michaela that to, uh, you know, improve her health? Sorry, I didn't get your specific question. I think mostly um, what Sophia told me to do was just make sure my fat quantity was up. So um, I know what I'm doing is mostly eating ribs, which are like su super fatty. So I've just been trying to increase as much fat as I can tolerate. Okay. And then, yeah, adding in liver. So that's mostly what I learned when I went there. Okay, that's, that's really helpful for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I also have a question for Sophia, is it? Um, actually, it's in two parts. One, I noticed on your charts you had both, when you were comparing diets, there was carnivore, and then there was your paleo-keto diet. Can you briefly explain the difference between them? Um, and my main question is for your clinical experience with people who have Crohn's disease, um, is it possible for a person who embarks on a meat diet to have a worsening of symptoms at first before they start to get better? And if so, how long should they stick with it before they begin to see healing? Um, yeah, so the difference between the PKD and the carnivore is more prominent when it comes to patients. Uh, and it is even more prominent when it comes to Crohn's disease patient. So we, we do consult with many patients with Crohn's disease who are coming from a, a carnivore society. And uh, until they are not able to adjust for the ratio and cut back on the amount of food they are eating, they will not get better. Okay. And when it comes to fat, just a general question, maybe Michaela. Um, I am, I've been carnivore for three months zero carb. I find that I have to eat a lot of lean meat, though, just because of the expense of fatty meat. What, what kind of recommended fats and what percentage if you have to add fat in to get enough fat? Um, so how, I'm, I'm not sure if this is exactly the right ratio, but what has made me feel the best, um, when I first started off, I had a really hard time with all the fat, um, digesting it, and I think that's part, partly to do with how much gut damage you have. Somebody with Crohn's disease would have quite a bit of gut damage. Um, so I just kind of took it easy and did whatever I could tolerate, which actually did involve leaner cuts at the beginning, um, which wasn't ideal. I wasn't as satiated, but it was easier for my, me to digest. And then the longer I've done this, um, the easier the fats have been to digest. So it got a lot easier around the five month period and the 10 month period again, it got a lot easier. And um, if you're looking at ways to like save money, I get chuck roast is a lot cheaper than ribeye. And that you, you can look at it and see how marbled it should be. And I think what I learned from Paleo Medicina was like it should look like it's almost a third percent fat. So if you get a really solid looking ribeye, it's about a third percent fat. You're looking for that. Um, 
chuck roast is a cheaper way to do it or make friends with a local local butcher and ask them for um, trimmings. Mm -hmm. And I will like chop that up and fry it. And it kind of turns like you can get it crispy to taste like bacon. That'll add in a whole bunch of fat. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for sharing your stories with all of us. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. We talked a lot about protein consumption and about fat. But what I didn't hear today was um, the difference between uh, most animals are grain-fed and grain-finished today. So the, the difference between animal, or, um, um, omega-6 and omega-3 uh, fatty acids and uh, the pro-inflammatory effects of omega-6 versus omega-3. Uh, uh, omega-6 being much more available uh, in, uh, in today's marketplace, although I'm doing something I hope to change that ratio uh, for everyone. And um, the other part is uh, the role or the anabolic effect of uh, mTOR when we're talking about the balance of how much protein we're supposed to eat. There's a lot of uh, talk about the uh, an anabolic effects of mTOR and as opposed to reducing IGF-1 and uh, uh, promoting, uh, you know, uh, growth. I mean, uh, Ron Rosedale, you know, would say that how much sugar and how much uh, fat you eat determines your lifespan and um, that the anabolic effects of eating uh, over a certain amount of protein can lead to unwanted, uh, you know, growth and promote cancer. So, so uh, as it applies to omega-3 and omega-6, first of all, if, if you are reducing the seed oils, your, your omega-6 levels are going to go so far down that the amount that you're getting for meat is really, I think, m much less of a problem. Um, to talk about ratios... Um, we don't want to confuse the ability of a sub or the uh, uh, availability of a substrate with the products of it. So, just because you have omega six doesn't mean you turn that into inflammation, and just because you have DHA doesn't mean you turn it into anti-inflammation. Those things have to be there has to be a reason for them to be called for. So, if you maybe it's the case that if you have a very inflammatory lifestyle then the omega-6 uh, omega makes the inflammation uh, more available to be made and that could become chronic. Uh, and then uh, I suppose it's possible if you take that away, then the, you won't have as much ability to create inflammation. Um, I should be looking at Siobhan because um, one thing that's really important to remember about inflammation is that inflammation itself isn't bad. It's the response to damage and it's a needed response. Um, so it, what sounds very simple is actually, is actually really quite complex. Um, I'm not sure that there is a huge difference between the amount of omega-3 in grass-fed and grain-fed, but I'm not really an expert on that. The other thing you brought up, oh, um, should we finish that topic? I have one thing to say about the mTOR as well, um, and then maybe someone else can take it. Um, mTOR is also, like we could probably have a whole day of talks about mTOR. Um, mTOR, is, uh, it picks up the signal of nutrition. And so you can't have a diet and not trigger mTOR um, unless it's even, I think even fat probably triggers it eventually. Um, so yes, uh, you don't want to have that always stimulated, but my opinion about that is that if you're on a ketogenic diet, as long as you're not eating 24-7, you will get that signal of mTOR, your body says we're getting fed, and then you'll stop eating and that signal will go away and you'll go into the fasting state, which is going to happen much faster from a ketogenic perspective. Like It, it probably takes, I, I'm going to make up a number, but maybe 12 hours to get where it would take two days to get from a high carb diet. Um, so even overnight, you're going to get that kind of fasting state that you need to have balanced with the fed state. And so even though I think that is important and maybe more important if you have a chronic disease like cancer to be aware of chronically stimulating mTOR, in the context of a low-carb diet, I think that that can be much overblown. Um, regarding the uh, omega-6 and omega-3, um, just kind of to piggyback on what Amber said, I communicate about a lot of these topics to college students, and so um, they are very concerned about um, spend, you know, 
limited funds. And I try to talk to them about doing the best they can at whatever point they're at. If they can just reduce the added omega-6s from, you know, the fried foods and the junk and salad dressing and a whole host of other things, if they're eating store-bought beef because that's what they can afford, they've still, I think, won 80 or 90 percent of the battle. And so, you know, in an audience like this, everybody's pretty sophisticated, but uh, I think many of us are trying to communicate to audiences um, that don't have that level of sophistication. And so, you know, I try to emphasize, um, are you going to give up the donuts? Or are you going to, you know, um, that kind of thing? So uh, I agree with that. And I think the balance of omega-3 and omega-6 is actually quite important. And I probably differ uh, slightly from uh, Amber's perspective on that. So if you have a look at the uh, enzymes, the desaturases that will convert um, the from ALA, for instance, down to the more active EPA or DHA, or on the other side, you've got the uh, omega-6 side, then they're shared enzymes, and effectively they compete. And there's a lot of research that shows that as one goes up, one goes down. Um, there's a lot of data points, there's a lot of papers demonstrating that. And at the omega-6 side of the equation, the vegetable and the seed oil, there's three products, or three major products, there's a, a whole heap, that we actually medicate against because they cause symptoms. So it produces something called arachidonic acid. We have then produced leukotrienes, which we treat in asthma. We produce prostaglandins, which we use anti-inflammatories for. And we then have thromboxane A2, which is sort of where we, what we inhibit with aspirin um, to reduce heart attacks. So it is certainly pro-inflammatory and I think if you have the same inflammatory stimulus, if you have an abundance of omega-6s, then that's going to be a, a more deleterious response. And in terms of does it actually do anything to your risk of dying, there's been two very good prospective studies. One was published in Nedrum, one was published in JAMA. Um, and they were population-based studies where they looked at the risk of sudden cardiac death, so arrhythmia-related, when the electrical system of the heart goes awry. And they found that the difference in those people who had the lowest level of omega-3 in their red blood cell membranes representing their body and the highest level of omega-3 and the areas that they were in quartiles and it was about 3% versus 7%, then the risk of sudden cardiac death differed in both studies by about 10 times. That's absolutely massive. And two good quality papers and for me that's pretty convincing. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad we're safe to differ here. <laughs> um, but I just, uh, I would like to point out that um, a ketogenic diet, as it also raises DHA, as I was talking about, it also raises arachidonic acid quite, quite significantly. Um, so if there's a problem with arachidonic acid, we're all in trouble. Uh, you may be correct about the ratios, though, and maybe they are, they are um, raised together. <laughs> So that's absolutely correct. It still will go up, but it tends to be a balance. So in a lot of studies we've done, we've actually... The standard ratio in a Western diet is about 1 to 15, which is absolutely ridiculous. And a standard ketogenic diet, even if you're having grain-fed meat, is going to be a hell of a lot better than that. And prospectively, if we can improve it down to a ratio of about 1 to 4, then that's where we're probably... We see a lot of health improvements. We see prospectively people with asthma symptoms goes away, rheumatoid arthritis symptoms improve, et cetera, et cetera. We have five minutes left. Hi, um, I have kind of an odd question. I don't know if you guys have experienced it or um, anybody, any patients, but going keto, keto carnivore, um, I, there's not a lot of uh, information I can find, but it's about the pruning of the fingertips. I keep having this issue happen to me, and I add more salt, less salt, more water. Uh, there's only like one little... Dr. Berg video that he has, it's like two minutes, and he just says that I'm either dehydrated or I need more salt or I have high insulin resistance. And I've been uh, keto for like the last nine months and probably two months into carnivore. And it happens less, but it still happens. And I just want to know if you guys have any answers. Just from pencil experience, <clears throat> I had it, but it passed. It just... Uh... After a while, It'll pass. so maybe 
I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah. I mean, I just concern like it mostly happens to my right hand, my right fingers, and um, I just don't want anything to happen with my kidneys if I am like supposedly I had it on both on all all, all fingers and uh, and the leg fingers as well. Oh, really? Your toes? Yeah. Yeah, it's just and my it hands. Passed. It'll pass. Yeah. Okay. I'll just have to wait and see. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just had a question for Zofia, and uh, I was just curious how your recommendations might change across different populations. Like, I, I believe I've heard you've worked with athletes before, so I'm just a little curious about, um, you know, the two-to-one ratio. Is that to achieve ketones, I assume? Um, but where did that exactly kind of come from? Because I've seen people achieve, you know, high ketone levels with, you know, one-to-one or 0.5-to-one or... Um, so the two-to-one uh, fat to protein ratio is a, a, a quite uh, um, general recommendation for all populations and also including athletes. So calor calorie basis? No, it is based gram. on gram. Wait. Yeah, gram, uh, dry matter content. And uh, so there are different phases um, uh, in the preparation of athletes and there is a point when uh, there may be a need to uh, change the fat to protein ratio in order to increase performance. But do you still start with the fairly low protein amount? I mean, I saw no, 60 on No, they, they start with the 2 to 1. Okay. And then it is uh, based on feedback on laboratory and, 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 and many specific measurements. And then to determine energy intake for the 2 to 1, is that based on total amount of food, and how do you kind of regulate that? Is that based on body weight? So uh, the recommendation is, uh, goes as uh, two to one, and then eat according energy. to, oh, yes. then uh, eat according to your hunger. It is about oh, okay. four to one, according okay. to energy. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, uh, blood work is an important feedback as well, because sometimes, uh, being being hungry, being satiated is very subjective. Hi, I'm Rafi. I run uh, the Nutrita website, and uh, my day job is actually neuroscience research. I'm researching schizophrenia in rats. So I had a question mainly for Sophia and uh, Dr. Mason, but it can apply to anyone on the panel. What's your experience with carnivory or keto carnivore when it comes to mental health, and specifically schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? Have you had uh, case studies, anything to mention there? Yes, we, we do have patients. Um, in these patients, the medication is a, is a critical issue because uh, there should be a match between tapering the medication and uh, going along the, the diet. And there are many interactions between the two, two so it is, it is a very tricky issue. It just gets better. Um, I think I'd probably uh, wait until George Reid comes this afternoon. I think she'll be the better person to ask. But I see a lot of people with um, issues sort of on the bipolar spectrum, bipolar 1, bipolar 2, or not so many schizophrenics, but um, certainly the bipolar um, improves quite dramatically. Thank you. That's it. Thank you.